Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks so much for coming this afternoon. I'm Jennifer King, the director of the library at Hampshire College, and it's a real pleasure to introduce this event and our guest, Joan Lippincott. But before I do that, I need to, um, to thank many people. First and foremost, um, I'd like to thank the Coalition of Networked Information. I'm grateful to many colleagues at Hampshire College, including the Vice President of Academic Affairs, Ava Rushman, the Creativity Center, Hampshire's President, Jonathan Lash, Marjorie Hutter in the Advancement Office, and to the Andrew Mellon Foundation for supporting this work, and especially the Library Learning Commons Ad Hoc Steering Committee. You might be wondering what is happening at Hampshire that led to today's program. Um, and I thought I'd spend a few minutes telling you about that before introducing our guest. So at the moment, um, the library at Hampshire is deeply engaged in planning for a library renovation that will create a more expansive, technology-rich, and integrated learning commons. Our opportunity is tied to a number of initiatives on campus, the most immediate of which is a new admissions portal building planned to open in the fall of 2015. Um, the new portal building created an opportunity for us because a decision was made to move the campus bookstore into the portal, and following on that decision, other moves have been discussed and decided upon, including moving um, our duplication center. And the result is the library will have at least 2,500 square feet of space opened up on our ground floor for library programming. And it's a pretty significant um, amount of space. The opportunity really gives us a chance or the ability to return to an early vision Hampshire's founders had for the library as the educative aorta of the institution. The educative aorta to us is a library that is the intellectual, cultural, and social hub of our campus community. And being Hampshire, that hub, we imagine, is filled with art, gallery spaces, rich collections and archives, media, maker spaces, and really stupendous, fabulous library librarians. Um, specific objectives of our library learning commons, and as I said, we're in the planning phase. We've been engaged in this process for the last 10 months, and we'll be continuing to plan into the spring, and then we'll start hiring an architect, coming up with designs, et cetera. But, um, our ideas are, specific objectives are, to create an academic hub bringing together complementary resources with library research workshops that would include writing support, qualitative and quantitative research support, the campus transformative speaking program, and our portfolio academic tutoring program. It's a park mentor program. We also want a cafe for obvious reasons. It brings people into the library. And I have a real strong conviction that the more people that actually come into the library and use the library will have better um, study experiences. And it also fosters community, which is so critical for engaging and teaching and learning, and also provides strong and good coffee or tea, also essential <laughs> for academic work. Um, the other area we really want to push and explore is our Makerspace Media Lab and Technology Sandbox. These are um, existing and original resources in the library, but they're very hidden and tucked away in the basement and could be more visible to engage more students and also show mark, showcase a little bit about what Hampshire does. And a multimedia gallery, which is just broadening our existing gallery space to make it a little bit more digital. So the planning process to date has been very um, or deeply affected by a comment Joan Lippincott made in an email to me after I imposed on her for advice, and I impose on a lot of people for advice regularly. She said, many spaces look much better after the renovation, but lack a corresponding service program that takes full advantage of the space and technologies. So that's, that's where we are right now, is really focusing on what that corresponding service program is and being intentional and thoughtful about how we imagine this renovated learning commons. Joan is the Associate 
Executive Director of the Coalition for Networked Information, a joint program of the Association of Research Libraries and EDUCAUSE. At CNI, Joan has provided leadership for programs in teaching and learning assessment, learning spaces, and collaboration. She is a widely published author and frequent, frequent speaker. She holds a number of chairships um, on the Association of College and Research Libraries New Publications Committee, was past chair of the editorial board of the College and Research Libraries News, and is on boards of Portal and the Network Digital Library of Theses and Dissertations Group, NDLTD. She serves on the advisory board of the Horizon Report, which is the EDUCAUSE Learning Initiative, seeking evidence of impact project, and the academic commons. She's been a consultant to many academic libraries for their information learning commons projects, um, and locally was a consultant to the University of Massachusetts Amherst Libraries and their learning commons planning. Joan spearheaded um, a new conference, or, or, or rather I would say she helped coalesce interest in seeing some newer libraries as they're designed. and has developed with colleagues the CNI Designing Libraries for the 21st Century Conference Program that I can highly recommend and am going to attend in just a few weeks at the University of Calgary with some of my colleagues here. Um, Joan's presentation is Library Learning Commons 3.0, focusing on learning and community. So without further ado, I or bring to you Joan Lippincott. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be here with you this afternoon in one of my favorite spots around the country, and also to be with colleagues, both longstanding and some new uh, colleagues. So thank you all for spending uh, your afternoon at a busy start of the semester uh, or academic year with us here. So I'd like to start by asking you to pause for a moment in your own thinking and looking at these two photos, which to you represents the 21st century library. The beautiful new Mansueto reading room at the University of Chicago, or the visual, data visualization studio at the NC State Hunt Library. Which model is the library for the 21st century? Well, I would contend that both have their place. Libraries continue to have great importance on campus as the place students can come for quiet solo study. And while my presentation will not be emphasizing that aspect of libraries, I do believe that it's extremely important for libraries to maintain part of their space for the traditional uses for which students and sometimes faculty still come to libraries. However, many libraries are developing exciting new programs that have to do with digital information. So they may not be publications in the traditional sense, but they are academic products in the digital environment whether it's in the sciences, the social sciences, or the humanities, many of our scholars are now working in new ways in digital formats, and libraries can support both the scholars and the students in this work. So, in this talk this afternoon, I'm gonna um, show you a lot of different spaces. I know for those of you here from Hampshire or some of the other five colleges other than UMass Amherst, you're in a, an environment where your library physically may be relatively small, your staffs may be relatively small. I really ask you to put aside what may be your own thinking that, well, only research libraries can do this or only large libraries can do this. All of the kinds of things that I'm going to show you, um, both services and technologies, can be part of any academic library today with the proper planning, the proper staff, the proper technologies, etc. So I'm going to talk, though, in particular about how we can think more intentionally of relating renovated or new library spaces to learning. And then for the 
last part of my presentation, which will be less than half, probably a, more like a third, I'm going to talk a little bit about libraries creating community and a place to nurture community on campus and some of the things in the physical library uh, that can um, be used to enhance community. So I'm going to surprise you by starting with an example from Special Collections and not a high technology example. In my view, libraries that promote learning invite students in to use collections. And what could be more important in many libraries than their special collections and or archives? At the University of Chicago, when they added that Mansueto uh, addition to the Regenstein Library, they were able to use a portion of the money to renovate the adjacent special collections. One of the things they did was take down a white uh, wall and replace it with these glass walls. I went in there and asked one of the curators, now that you have this, these glass walls, do more students, do more undergraduates come in to use special collections? And he said, they're very timid about it. They walk in and they say, am I allowed to come in here? And the answer is yes. And then they start examining the exhibits and start asking about how they can have access to these materials. Most libraries are no longer wanting or wishing to hide away their special collections. And I say, make them visible. We need to show people what we have in our libraries and invite them in to make use of them. Further, we need seminar rooms where students can meet with special collections librarians and their faculty with their professors to have sessions that review uh, the, the materials, where materials can be handled uh, as a group under supervision and where they can talk about developing student projects. But I also want to talk about what is, for me personally, the sweet spot. And that is when today's students take traditional special collections materials and create digital exhibits or create digitally enhanced content uh, uh, for their projects. In this case, this is a University of Chicago grad student, I believe a master's student, who has taken um, illuminations from manuscripts in the collection and looked around the campus for um, things in the architecture, in the environment, in the gardens, and made some kind of correspondence or relationship between the illustrations in the manuscripts and contemporary University of Chicago uh, places and, and, uh, and artistic elements that she's seen. And so she not only wrote a paper, I don't know for certain if it was her master's thesis, but she did an exhibit that was highlighted in the special collection space on screens, and they also put it on the web. So this is a way for our young scholars to take traditional content get very deeply engaged in it, make it their own, and put it out to a a global audience in the digital environment. And that's the kind of thing that I would love to see us enhance in our libraries. Now next I'm going to move to the other extreme, and that is gaming. So I think of gaming as being very, very different kind of activity taking place in libraries from using manuscripts in special collections. At the Hunt Library at NC State, they have an enormous gaming space that they use as a lab for classes in their computer science uh, and, and engineering, their uh, department and their college of engineering and, uh, and design. One of the top ranked academic video game development programs in the nation. So students are using this for classes and workshops, but anyone can go in there and use that space outside of uh, when it's reserved for classes, it's open late hours into the night. And one of the most interesting examples I learned about recently was on a tour of the library, 
a professor in, I believe it was a history class, saw the gaming library and with her students decided they wanted to use gaming technologies to create an exhibit, a digital exhibit of some historical event. And so the staff of the library worked with this faculty member and her class using this high-end technologies to create a group class project um, employing uh, that, that had history as the academic content. So this kind of facility is sparking innovation, sparking creativity, but there has to be the staff in place that not only knows the technology, but knows collections, knows information, understands curriculum, understands how to work with faculty. It's not a simple matter of just having the space and the technologies. At McMaster University in Canada, they also have a game room where they have both a collection of games and I believe three group study rooms that are configured for use, uh, for game use. And they are very specific on their website to describe that these spaces are an academic space with an academic purpose behind it, supporting several courses about gaming as well as individual research. And I believe the programs at McMaster using gaming technologies are computer science, communications, and education. So all of these have a connection to the curriculum. And part of what I think is really important as you plan your space, whether it's here at Hampshire College or for those of you from other institutions, is to think about what your institution needs, what your curriculum needs, what the faculty who are doing innovative things with technology need and want that could be supported through the library. At the University of Pennsylvania, in their Weigel Information Commons, it's a little bit bigger than that, but not all that much bigger. They have, to me, what seems like one of the best staffs that I have um, been in touch with, because they work so closely with faculty on assignment development. The staff meets with faculty to talk about what are they trying to accomplish in pedagogical terms and in the academic content of their work. A lot of, I'd say the majority of the projects that they're working on are video, student video creation as a, as a course project. But in addition, they're doing a working with faculty on uh, students developing websites or um, narrated PowerPoints or other types of things. They provide workshops for the classes with which they're working, then one-on-one -on -one consultation, and they lend uh, the high-end equipment. They both lend it and have it in place in their uh, media center. One of the th ways that they get more faculty interested in doing new types of teaching and learning experiences for students is their annual workshop, where the faculty who have worked with the media staff present to other faculty about their assignment development, the support from the media center, and it's a great way for them to explain not only what they've accomplished with their student assignments, but I've listened to some of the audio interviews and invariable, invariably the faculty member will talk about how deeply engaged the students became in developing these uh, projects and how they often will state that they believe the students learned more in that class than they had previously when they did something like a paper or an exam. Now, media projects don't have to be a full substitute for a paper or exam. They may be one project in a course that also has a regular paper or in some cases, say with a short video assignment, students will be required to write a paper that supplements the video. So all of these things are possibilities, but serious work can be done in these cases. In most of these cases, the faculty members don't want to have to learn the software. They don't want to have to be responsible for problems with equipment. And that's where the library media staff comes in. The faculty member does not need to be able to use all the technology him or herself. The support comes from the library. But there has to be that staff in place to be able to offer those services. Now, another uh, kind of new media project that I was 
just enchanted by, I saw when I visited the college at Brockport, which is where I had my first job, one of the smaller SUNY institutions. They had an exhibit of very large posters. I'm sorry you can't get the scale of the poster on the right. It was up high on like the second floor balcony of the main lobby, and they were all around the, the, uh, the lobby, uh, different student posters, and on the left, on the uh, main floor, they had a sign describing what these posters were. The students in an art class had been given the assignment to create a mashup poster. They had to find images that were available either through a Creative Commons license or in the public domain. And then when they created their poster, they had to apply a Creative Commons license to it. So this was not only a creative project, but it was a really good exercise in having students learn about intellectual property in their field. And it was done in conjunction with um, Open Access Week in the library. And I just thought, what a really wonderful kind of assignment, working with the um, art uh, liaison librarian, the faculty member, and the students. I'm often asked, um, as people are renovating or designing libraries, about the need for in-place equipment, since so many students have mobile devices, whether they're smartphones, laptops, um, wrist wa or watches uh, or whatever Apple's going to come out with uh, in another week or two or whatever media, whatever kind of equipment it is. And my answer is that I do think that, st first of all, uh, there are a number of um, studies in various libraries that show most students don't bring their laptops to campus. And so laptop loan and in-place desktops are still extremely popular in libraries. But even if it comes to a point where they're not, and I think that point could come when uh, tablets become more ubiquitous with students, which they're not right now, but if their functionality uh, uh, becomes greater, which is, is happening, and more students can afford to buy them, I think we'll see more and more tablets. However, I still think students will need to come to a place like the library that's open a lot of hours and that has spaces where they can use large monitors and can print and use other types of equipment that won't be, you know, they, they can't carry around. So on the left, I was visiting the University of Nebraska and saw this student using her own laptop, but she was manipulating this image on the large screen behind her. She was actually turning it around in a 3D um, image. I have no idea what this thing was. I didn't want to interrupt her, but it was fascinating to me to see her using her laptop to to turn this image so that she could watch it more uh, in greater detail on the large screen. Another way that uh, more and more students are going to work in a 3D environment is through 3D printers or other kinds of uh, technologies in maker spaces. And at the Hunt Library, one of the things that I like about what they're doing, I know you can't see what they made that well, but we need to explain to students what some of the equipment is and what they can do with it, especially linked to their academic work. Some people see 3D printers as something like, I'll print out some favors for the Friday night party or something like that. But there's really serious work um, going on with them when I was at, um, this is a, a 3D printed tactile map. And when I was at visiting University of Virginia, they showed me a 3D map of a pond ecosystem, for example. I've also heard some stories recently that have just totally um, made me think this is gonna take off much faster than many of us even thought. When I heard about the, the um, printing out of prosthetic devices uh, on 3D printers and heard someone interviewed on the radio about the fact that he was printing these devices out for, it was either a three-year-old or a five-year-old who would grow very quickly and therefore could create these inexpensively for different activities and as she grew, it was 
inexpensive to create new devices uh, for this child who, who was lacking an arm. Well, you may not have a medical school or engineering program on your campus, but there are going to be more and more um, uses for 3D printers and more and more students wanting to, um, to experiment with this technology. Now, one of the important things about libraries is that on many campuses, you would find the th that there is a pr 3D printer, but it belongs to a department. And that department may not allow students, say, from the English department or the art department to come in and use their 3D printer. One of the um, real attractions of housing uh, equipment in the library is that it's uh, available to everyone. The library's ethic is, uh, you know, this is the place where anyone can have equal access uh, to the resources. So that would, is one argument. The second argument is that even if, uh, say, the School of Engineering allowed other students to come in, they probably don't have a staff person there assigned to support. The students who are in engineering may have been through a class and they learned how to use it, but a, a, a newbie uh, would normally not have a way to get help. Again, in the library, the service ethic is that you develop a program of service for these technologies and you have uh, qualified staff available to work with um, students or faculty or staff. And, of course, the, the number of hours that the libraries open also make it very attractive as a place to locate um, this kind of equipment. Uh, so more and more students want to make things. I just wanted to show this uh, photo. This is not a library. This is an engineering school at Purdue because Again, I think that it's so important that we show people the capabilities of the equipment or the availability of services that we want to promote. So you have this very dramatic signage with three um, digital displays that explain what they can do. It's a fabrication lab, you know, just adjacent to this. I couldn't get it all into one photo. At the very, very far right, you can barely see some windows. You can look right into this big fabrication lab. And what they're promoting here, to me, it seems, you know, this could probably be a motto for Hampshire College as well, right? Um, in terms of the, the link with the community, the impact um, of what you're doing in your education on the real world. And so as you redesign your spaces, think about how you're going to communicate what you're trying to accomplish or what you're encouraging people to accomplish in your spaces. Similarly, I really liked these signs, one at the Syracuse University iSchool, so again, it was not the library, but the school preparing information professionals for their innovation studio, which is really a multimedia studio, and they say, uh, speak up, fail big, expect the unexpected, and all of that is on this sign. In other words, come in and really try things out. You don't have to have the perfect project. This is here for you to innovate and experiment. And on the right, George, at the Georgia Tech Library, this is in the older part of their library, and they're embarking on a major uh, renovation. They've been doing it incrementally. I'm not showing a space, a, a photo of the room, but in a way I should, because it is the least glamorous space. It's almost like a closet, okay? But it is the startup exchange. And it says, ideate, execute your startup, meet up with your fellow student entrepreneurs. But it also says, utilize Georgia Tech resources for market research, multimedia development, and patent information. So I really like the way they're connecting the information aspects of this space, which is in the library, to the kind of ethos of Georgia Tech, a place where you're going to have a lot of student entrepreneurs. And at any of your institutions here, you may also have student entrepreneurs. So it's an interesting model. I have not seen this specifically, certainly not another library that I've visited. There probably are uh, incubators uh, on other campuses, although often they're for startup companies. They're not for undergrads um, or, or graduate students. 
As I mentioned uh, at the beginning of my presentation, exemplary spaces in for libraries provide both the collaborative spaces, which I've emphasized and will continue to emphasize in my talk, because they're the newer thinking or the newer types of spaces we need to design in libraries, but they also need to provide these solo contemplative spaces. There's no other place on campus that has that as a mission or is so identified in people's minds uh, with, with that um, environment, and we really do need to meet people's expectations. However, I have found that in libraries that have implemented collaborative spaces, the biggest problems are with the collision of the collaborative spaces and the quiet spaces. Why? Because sometimes it just hasn't been thought through in a very practical way. For example, there are no barriers like glass doors or walls between the collaborative and the um, uh, solo spaces. In some cases where libraries often have grand atriums, the upper floors are the quiet floors, but if the commons is on the main floor, the noise might go right up the atrium. I've known a couple of libraries that have had to glass in the atrium on the upper floors in order to prevent the noise from permeating the other floors. But I also feel libraries don't always provide the right visual cues. If you want solo contemplative space, why put in big group tables? Why, you know, and I see this a lot, really a lot. Um, think about what you're saying, or, or even a, just a cluster of easy chairs where students are going to gather and take a break. So think about what visual cues you're giving through the furniture style and placement. And then the signage. Some libraries do a really good job, uh, although some do it mostly through scolding. I think that there are opportunities to create signage that um, is a little bit friendlier. And I personally, I liked this signing at University of Leicester, the silent, intellectual, serious, remember, this is the silent zone. To me, you know, it's a little bit better than no cell phones, no this, no that, no talking, you know, kind of um, very brash signs that I've seen in, in some spaces. Another uh, library that I know of calls their quiet area the serenity room. I really like that. And it actually has some things around that make it have a little bit of a spa environment, big stones. And I guess stones must be an, an emblem for science, for silence in, in some uh, people's minds. So think about this really carefully because this is the biggest area of tension in libraries today the conflict between the quiet and the group space. I think that we could do a better job, too, of explaining to our user community at large how these newly renovated spaces can be used. Uh, I was lucky enough to visit the Chinese University of Hong Kong Library recently, and they had a display board of, it's a really big open space, of all the ways on the left that it was configured for different kinds of groups. Some were classes, some were outside speakers, some were like uh, poetry or other types of readings, some were open houses, and they showed you right there. And on the right, this was a digital display showing someone giving a, a guest lecture um, in this space. People don't always understand how they can use um, these different environments, and having these clearly displayed, um, I think, helps get that message across. Of course, this can also be on your library website to explain to people what you have available and how it can be used, if it can be reserved, etc. I'm going to move to another, um, briefly, to another area. which is spaces supporting student success. One of the things that 
information or learning commons frequently do is bring together a variety of services from other units on campus, whether it's career counseling or academic advisement, the writing center, um, lots of different units. But in most cases, you end up with a co-located service, which may provide convenience for students, but in my view does not actually leverage the opportunities that collaboration uh, would allow. So at Dartmouth, in their writing center, they are jointly training from the library, the writing center, and academic computing student assistants who can tutor at a, up to a certain level in all three areas. So when you think of it, when a student is having problems completing an assignment, is it really realistic to think that the student only needs help with writing? Isn't it very likely the student's also going to need help either finding information or formatting citations or finding um, images to embed in their paper or something? And what about using some uh, advanced features of technology? Why shouldn't we do more genuine collaboration that is focused on the student's needs rather than on our administrative unit structure? But it's really hard to break out of that. I realize that. But I think it's a goal that we should have in mind. And this does not happen um, by serendipity. I think it has to be very intentional because it takes a commitment of resources. It's people's time. It may be people's budgets for student staff, in this case, uh, having to, to figure it out. And some um, places that have done these kinds of things, and I don't know about uh, Dartmouth, will do written agreements so that they will have um, a clear expectations of what each partner is going to bring to the table, whether it's the equipment, the staff time and expertise or whatever. But I really encourage you <coughs> as, um, I really encourage you as you think through the services and the units that you incorporate into your library or learning commons to think about who will be a genuine partner and collaborator with you. And thinking of it not just of the staff but starting with what are the student needs that could be better fulfilled through a partnership and coming at it in, in that manner. So I've talked a lot about various spaces, lots of the media kinds of spaces, and you might have noticed that I haven't shown a lot of photos of information or learning commons per se. And what I've found um, as I've traveled around is that information commons are certainly very popular. I don't know of a single one that hasn't greatly upped the statistics for uh, library entry. You know, students flock to them. They're, they're used many hours of, of the day. They're a great spot for working in a group, whether it's on a formal group project or just being in a place and studying with your friends or with other people. It's a convenient place to access technology. Students will run in and use a computer to check their email or check uh, their course management system in between classes. And uh, it can be a spot to find these various services um, like academic advising or the career center. But in my view, there hasn't been enough connection between the capabilities of the equipment and services of the learning commons and the actual instructional program of the institution. And so that's what really Jennifer asked me to address is how do we move this to the next level? And so uh, I'm using the, the code uh, learning commons 3.0. Uh, I don't feel strongly about that terminology, but really what I'm trying to um, focus on here is how do we take the relationship of library service technology and spaces to the next level? So in terms of curricular factors, to me, taking it to the next level means working closely with faculty to plan new types of assignments 
that would not have been possible without the resources that have been put into renovating the library. And to develop these spaces with the priorities of the institution or specific departments or programs in mind, and that you could actually say very intentionally, our university or our college has a mission to help students learn how to be a member of a team or how to express themselves in new media in a way that is still representing an academic argument. Something like that. When I go to media labs, if I talk to the staff and I ask them about what kinds of projects, they'll start reeling off this assignment, that assignment, this department, this faculty member. If I go to a library learning commons, often I get a blank stare. They don't know what students are using it for, what classes are coming in, because it's really become in many institutions more like the living room of the campus. Now that may be fine. It really may be just what's needed on the campus. But I think that in at least some cases, if there were a closer connection to some of the kinds of assignments that were, be given and that were being given and you could show a clear correspondence between the availability of the equipment, of the software, of the expertise of the staff and what the students are accomplishing, it would mean more value for the investment in that renovation or in that new facility. So at Purdue, just as an example of the intentionality, one of the things in their school of business that they're uh, doing more and more is focusing on international uh, management. And one of the things, uh, business school of course has some uh, very practical components and they want to teach their students how to do video conferencing with people in distant places, say in, in Asia. And this would be very akin to a communications program wanting to develop public speaking skills or that kind of thing. And so they've built in their economics, uh, business and economics library two rooms with video conferencing capabilities where part of the group can go in one room, part of the group into the other, and they practice their video conferencing skills with each other. Now, these video conferencing rooms can be used for all kinds of other purposes, for guest speakers, for interviews, if students want to do a, a distant interview with an expert in the field, etc. But they were, they were planned with a specific intention, with a specific purpose in mind, but that space is still fully adaptable for many other types of uses. But it had a clear connection to one of the objectives of the curriculum for that program. I also think that these spaces can be used to help tie our library technology closer to content. So I love this assignment at the University of Richmond Library, which houses um, the Digital Scholarship Center, and they worked in connection with the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Technology and a faculty member to develop an assignment. The course was about American expat writers um, living in Paris. So think uh, the Woody Allen movie or this is a period I always love to read about. Uh, there's some, some wonderful books, as well as the reading of the authors of the period. There's some wonderful histories of this period. And the assignment for the students was to develop um, a, a geo-referenced uh, website. So they took a Google map and each of them selected an author. They had to study uh, the author and Edith Wharton's coming up in the box. And the student would then place um, that uh, item where either she lived or her studio or a salon or, you know, whatever it was. And so you had this map of all these different places um, in Paris, and then if you clicked on the link in the Edith Wharton box, you would get an essay written by the student. So um, to me, these are the kinds of activities that both engage students more in their learning. They provide them with a project that they can then show future employers.
but they also you know, enable them to gain skills that they can use in both their academic and professional work in the future. But this was done because of the team effort between um, the library, uh, the Center for Learning and Teaching, and uh, the faculty member. Some, uh, in fact, more and more libraries are developing classrooms for, pro um, for uh, project problem-based learning, uh, often referred to as the flipped classroom, uh, like this one at Virginia Tech, and I know of a, a number of others, which are used both for information literacy instruction and often are uh, programmed for at least part of the day for other courses on campus. The problem with these rooms is that in many, and I'm not talking about Virginia Tech, I'm not singling, singling them out, but is that if you ask people about how they're being used, it's a very mixed report. Sometimes faculty or librarians just like to use them because they've been freshly painted and there's new furniture. They have not actually changed their pedagogical style. And so we need to have the corresponding workshops and perhaps mentorship with faculty who either want or need to change their pedagogy in order to enhance student success. It doesn't just happen magically by providing the space. The services need to go along with the uh, space and the technology. Here's another um, pedagogical factor that I just loved. Uh, this is also from Virginia Tech. And one of the things that students do not always get excited about either media projects or working in groups. Some of you may already know that. But this student um, who helped create this wiki on uh, cancer in animals, and I'm going to read this quote in case you can't all see it. I hate working in groups, and as a biology major, I had never experienced a class so revolved around group work. And this person was a senior biology major. As the semester went on, though, cancer biology became less of a class and more of a life experience for me. I realized I could actually be interested in what I was learning. I have to say, to me, that was the saddest comment from a senior major I could read. Um, rather than just learning it to get a good grade on an exam, which perhaps a lot of people heading to med school, that's really you know the, the focus. But anyway, I found that's my editorializing. I found out about the importance of cooperating well with others and working as a team for the betterment of other team members, employees, and clientele, not just myself. So I really do believe that these kinds of projects have the capability of transforming learning for students. Maybe not every student, not, maybe not every instance, but there are so many examples of students becoming both more deeply engaged in their learning and more interested in working as a team on a project. Because extensive, you know, pretty, High-end multimedia projects, they really do normally involve more than one person. They're often not solo projects. And they're not in the academic world either. I don't know of a single digital humanities project that's done by an individual, for example. None. If you have an example, you can tell me in the Q&A. Uh, so some technology factors that I think are um, exemplary f characteristics of Learning Commons 3.0 would be something like a, a, a technology sandbox. This is the one at the University of Calgary. They've got all this equipment just out in an open space. They do have a student who uh, is there to help out, but anyone can just walk up to these things and try them out. I had never seen the sphere. You can pick it up and it has software in it that shows things like, you know, the universe or the or planets or, you know, other kinds of things that are in a, in a round uh, environment. Uh, the one closest uh, with the white table, it's one of the Microsoft surfaces. Um, NC State has had one of these technology sandboxes for a while. And it's a way to play with equipment to see, is this something that would be used? This is more experimental, um, bringing things in, uh, for both faculty and students to try out and see if they have uh, a use in, in your institution. 
And also uh, with technology, they provide these kinds of spaces for creation of new content, as well as places to display it and to hold workshops. At the uh, UCLA, the, the uh, Research Library for Humanities and Social Sciences, they revamped several of their floors. When I was visiting there, they were hosting an NEH Summer Institute in this space. And it was really ideal for people to sit on, on this soft furniture and work together on these screens. They had other areas that were more like seminar rooms where they could do workshops. They have large video displays um, showing the various types of work that's being done. And the UCLA is doing some very uh, exciting work in the digital humanities. So people could see examples of what um, is being produced at that institution. Ideally, as you develop, this may take some years to put into place, is to create a holistic program. And one of the places that I think has done a really um, commendable job is a small college, Occidental College out in California. Look at this website where they show the various services that they're offering. Open public scholarship, digital media and design, critical making, information fluencies, uh, teaching and learning with new media and not even reading all of those. And they've put together a staff um, there that is working with faculty, that's working with students. Um, their, their most recent thing they're doing that I think is genius um, is that one of their um, digital humanities person reached out to a number of courses and those a certain number of courses are adding a one credit option to their um, to the course that is a digital humanities lab. So you take the class and then you take an extra um, credit throughout the semester to work on a project in, um, in the digital uh, environment with a lab, which I think is a wonderful idea. So to recap, before I go into the last and the community uh, part, which will be much shorter, um, some of the reasons that libraries are moving into this direction is that they, libraries can be the central place on campus where students can access uh, technologies and work collaboratively no matter what department or major they're affiliated with. There are people, skilled people to help. And if there aren't, you need to think carefully about whether you're ready to move in this direction or how you're going to get the people in place um, to, to do this. They are welcoming safe places, which is also important. When we think about the late night hours that some students are working, it really is helpful to have a place that everyone knows they'll find other people, even at midnight. And in many cases, they offer this expertise in curriculum or assignment development. If not, they can, libraries can be working jointly with instructional technologists elsewhere on campus or centers for teaching and learning. But there are a number of challenges. First, when people have the opportunity, they get the funds to renovate or design a new space, it's all about the floor plan and the furniture. I know so many places I visited, that's what it's about. But it really is going to miss the mark. It's not going to really achieve the, the potential of what you could achieve without addressing the new kinds of skills that um, staff will need to provide services or the kinds of cross-campus or even internal to the library partnerships that need to be established to take the most advantage of these new opportunities. I think that more outreach is needed so that, I mean, how many faculty, and there may be some in this room, really understand the library's role in new media today? A lot of faculty really have no idea of what libraries are getting into and what expertise they have on their staff. And we need to find more and more ways to do outreach and promotion. And then I think um, since everyone is limited in the number of staff that they have, there are very few opportunities to add new staff uh, or additional staff, 
sometimes you have to stop doing some things when there are other things that right now have a higher priority. That's something that each library and each institution has to decide. What are the most important priorities? Where should the time and staff effort go today? However, I think there are great opportunities to engage students uh, in deeper learning, to prepare them for the world of research, business, public service, and the arts. Can you think of any job today that doesn't want to hire new graduates with good technology skills? Really? And I think our faculty in our institutions need to understand that. They're doing students a huge favor if they give them assignments where they'll need to develop technology skills, which, by the way, the faculty may think the students have, but most of them don't, at least at a high-end technology skills. Um, libraries have the opportunity to celebrate their communities through displays and events and leverage the expertise of various staff, various campus units through collaboration. So some of the things, some of the questions that you might ask, whether you've had a long established program but are moving to the next level or starting out, is to think not just where should we put the computers and how should we do the collaborative space? How should we arrange the furniture? Instead, what can the library do that enhances the teaching and learning capabilities of your institution's academic departments? How are you integrating instruction and individual assistance into the space? What partnerships will strengthen student learning? And can they be genuine partnerships? And how do you promote the use of content, including digital content. Because I still maintain that while we talk a lot about technology, the particular role of libraries is to promote the use and production of content. Okay? Not technology in general, but we're talking about information, academic content, whether, but the new emphasis is on production of content and not just access. Access is still important, but we want to have that continuum of access to content, to creation of new content. As you plan, you are, many of you in this room are already quite familiar with techniques for understanding how students learn, how to use observational techniques. There is not as much focus, though, from what I've seen on what's going on in the curriculum, what faculty might want to accomplish. Um, think about, in I think, a great target group are newly tenured faculty who might be ready to turn more attention to teaching and learning. What might they like to do if they could get support from the library to develop new kinds of assignments for their students. Always keep the learner at the center and balance the content, the technologies, the services, and the facility. So I'm going to um, finish by talking a little bit about libraries nurturing communities. I was visiting Oklahoma State University talk about the boonies, and um, it was really out in the middle of nowhere, kind of a barren area, and walked into the library, and actually it's on the second floor, but in an open, uh, an area open to the lobby, there was what I thought was quite a lovely gallery focusing on special collections and a lovely regional painting and comfortable seating for the students. And having driven through part of this, um, on my way you know, from the airport, this area, I thought, what would it be like for a student growing up on some farm on the, or ranch on the prairie to come in and see this? They're inviting students into the conversation. They're inviting students into the academic world. And they're celebrating the culture and the traditions of their community. And I really liked the way they represented this, and they made this a public open space for students. Also think about um, libraries as the place where students spend long hours. And in cold climates like the University of Toronto, Mississauga, what could be nicer than coming to the fireplace in the library? 
So I know there may be fire code restrictions and other kinds of problems, but there are actually a number of libraries. I'm going to do a series someday of photos of uh, fireplaces and libraries, because I think it's a really, really nice idea. Since students spend a lot of long hours at night in cold climates like Amherst, Mass. <laughs> Many also provide food for students studying many hours. Some go the high, high visibility brand like Starbucks. Others go at the University of Calgary, the local natural foods provider. Again, I know on many of your campuses, you have so many restrictions about what you can and can't do with food service. You may not have uh, the options that you wish you had, but here are two examples of places that were able to make something work that they thought would be good for their uh, institution. I noticed here uh, at the Hampshire College Library, they have a table where they have Lego pieces out. And at this library, I love these colorful um, uh, stools with chess game and other kinds of games near the snack machines where students can take a break. And these cafes, this was a really pretty one at Duke. I've heard so many comments of cafes being the meeting place for students and faculty outside of class. So it's not just the provision of food, but one of the characteristics of student engagement and the George Q work with a National Survey of Student Engagement is how much time students are spending with faculty outside of class, and a cafe can encourage that. There are also just things that you can think up that might work for your clientele, your constituency. At Brigham Young, when I was there, they had this just big white paper incoming class of 2012 that the students signed. Think about it. It's a belonging thing. It's saying, you know, I'm a new student. I'm signing this. I am part of this group, providing a connection and a sense of community. And at the Polytechnic University of Hong Kong, at exam time, they put up this board in the library where students wrote notes of luck to their fo fellow students. You know, it's a little bit in Asia, sometimes you have these trees where you, you put wishes on them. So it was akin to that. So again, it, it related to their culture and kind of the team spirit of cheering on your fellow students that's part of, of some Asian cultures. Again, back at Brigham Young, you may want to um, develop specialized rooms, in this case, an honors reading room. Um, I think that some of, uh, sometimes there are programs that may really benefit from having their own room. Sometimes it's a graduate student study. But think about some programming that can go along with it and not just a room with nice furniture. Also in terms of creating community, I'm not sure this is exactly why they developed it, but I loved these whiteboards at the University of Washington Research Commons and the furniture uh, around it. To me, it was kind of like the marketplace of ideas of you could see what different students had been working on and gathering on, um, and a way just to communicate what people are thinking or doing. Libraries really can be the third place. These are some of Oldenburg's characteristics, which are clearly uh, the kinds of, th these are just some of his, but those that I thought uh, particularly relate to what most libraries uh, provide. Also, your own environment should be a key. So at University of Colorado Boulder, they had these tables outside on a plaza air area where, by the way, they also had, uh, you could purchase a brick and inscribe it with your favorite author or a saying, you know, for a donation, which I thought was a nice idea. And they said, but students really aren't sitting there. So I actually um, suggested to them, they put up the chalkboard to make it more of a, an outdoor classroom area. And on the right, have you ever found a library with a screen porch? Doesn't that, I mean, not, whether or not you've been to UC Santa Cruz, probably your mental image of UC Santa Cruz means library with a screen porch. It fits with their, um, their, their character. And at Cornell, 
Mann Library, a place I worked many years ago after uh, I was, had been gone quite a while, and they did their renovation, they made part of it this beautiful garden. That library, one of the programs it serves, is the landscape architecture program. And they had uh, an alum create the sculpture there from the pieces of a building that had been torn down uh, nearby. At Penn State, uh, they have a Charles Adams, this huge mural. I actually don't know his connection, and I know you have a lot of art here at Hampshire College, uh, much of which has been done by students and alums or art that relates to the notion of a library, whether it's creating a sculpture out of an old card catalog, or someone reading, or whatever. And we can also exhibit faculty and student work, and I'll be using an image um, from Hampshire College Library of the magic board uh, that they have in their library that's promoting student work right when you come into the entrance. And this is the video wall at Duke, and there are a few other places that have these things where they you really kind of compete to be able to get your uh, work onto that wall. They have a changing exhibit there. And at the Hunt Library, when they opened this you know, incredible new library at NC State, they uh, developed a tag on Instagram called My Hunt Library, encouraging students to take their photo of their favorite place so it's on the web, but also they created this big display near the entryway to the library. Again, creating this sense of it is my library and you know, this is what I love about it and creating a sense of community. So as you think about your renovation, how can you make your space welcoming, comfortable, and inspiring? How can you use art or symbols to link the library or art to the culture of your institution? And how do you signal the unique library aspects of your third space? Some planning resources that I wanted to highlight are the Learning Space Toolkit, uh, developed at NC State, but with a partnership with Brightspot, and I know here at Hampshire you have connections to that organization, and uh, the Learning Spaces Collaboratory Guide uh, is also an excellent resource. When I was given a tour at the University of Calgary, at the end of the tour, it was just a one-on-one -on -one tour, a person came up to uh, this woman, Donna Livingstone, one of the staff members, it was a student, asking if, if her student organization could have some kind of exhibit in the library. And after she left, Donna turned to me and said, you know, this library just attracts ideas. And I thought, wow, what could be better for a library to be able to say when it completed its renovation, then it attracts ideas. So I hope as you all develop your renovated and new spaces that you also have places that attract ideas but keep things in balance with the user at the center. It's not about the space, it's by providing the synergy among all of these elements. So thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to take comments or questions.